I had done a video on morality more than a year ago. I want to expand on that topic here. Just like in that video and many videos on morality you see done by other people, I will be addressing meta-ethics. However, whereas those videos only mention meta-ethics, I will be going into other parts of this issue too. I will be starting with meta-ethics, but keep watching to the end of the video because I will be touching on things like consensus later. My position is that morality is subjective. I know some of you will object, saying this is too simplistic, but watch through to the end. Right here I am only talking about meta-ethics and only the very core of morality. That moral feeling you have that you might call a conscience is what I am limiting morality to for this part of the video. By going to the root of it and focusing only on meta-ethics, I can avoid all the messiness that tends to surround the subjective-objective debate. It's a big mess that makes some conclude it is neither one. So that is why I'm breaking this down into parts. It's really for the sake of clarity. The main reason I conclude there is no objective morality is simply lack of evidence. There is no source anyone can point to which is objective. Without that, there is no reason to think it exists. Some may point to a designer, but I have debunked that many times over in several other videos. We can see that any moral code is nothing but a snapshot of the time and culture it was written in. So again, we have no evidence. Some may point to our consensus. However, that is a topic for later when I discuss the normative side of this. You cannot determine what ought to be from what is. So that is why this issue must be kept separate. The fact that these shared moral feelings exist says nothing about what ought to be. You can look at it this way, too. If you could compare a human with an intelligent alien from a non-social species, one is highly unlikely to see much moral agreement. This is due to social instincts having no bearing on this hypothetical being. So, again, we have no source. So, until someone has some objective source they can point to, we have no reason to think it exists. Therefore, morality is subjective. We also have, at the root of morality, something that is simply a feeling, which is subjective by definition. An objective source of such feelings does seem to imply an intelligent agent of some sort, which, as I said before, is not a valid concept. So, with this conclusion of subjectivity, we can move on from meta-ethics to other aspects of this topic. As I mentioned, our evolution as a social species gives us a great deal of agreement on morality. In fact, it would probably be nearly identical in people if it weren't for certain factors I will discuss later. If you look at the evolution of a social species, you will see some form of social behaviors which are instinctual they have an advantage for group survival. The more sophisticated the species, the more sophisticated these instincts are. You can see evidence of this by looking at the behaviors of different species and comparing them. With our extremely complex prefrontal cortex, humans of course have a very complex and nuanced set of instinctual social behaviors. These manifest in our minds as moral feelings or conscience. This is what gives us a very good basis to come up with some sort of a moral standard. It's not objective, but it doesn't have to be. An agreed-upon standard can be set regardless of its completely subjective nature. There are also some things that interfere with this consensus and even alter our social instincts. The first is mental illness. That's a fairly obvious one. Some mental illnesses may be so minor that they may not even be recognized as a disorder. However, they can still be an abnormality having some small effect on what someone would morally feel if they did not have that condition. Our moral feelings would be considered a priori as we are born that way. They can, of course, be affected by a posteriori knowledge. While there are exceptions, this is nearly always a negative thing. 
Religion is a sort of a posteriori conditioning which can alter a person's moral feelings to some degree. The living conditions and culture one is raised in can have an effect on this as well. We also have us versus them groupthink and various forms of propaganda which can also alter one's moral feelings. Culture and living conditions, as well as other environmental factors, can have a large impact, especially when someone uses propaganda to reinforce this change in thinking. Religion tends to have a widely varying degree of effect. As I have proven in another video, at least some cherry-picking must be used to follow any religion due to the contradictory nature of certain tenets. So when someone with very little a posteriori conditioning, the religion will be cherry-picked mainly based on what conforms with our unaltered consensus. In the case of someone with a lot of a posteriori conditioning, the religion will be cherry-picked to match that and may be radically different from our unaltered consensus. One big factor in this is how strictly a child is told to interpret a religion, as well as the power of the tactics used to reinforce this. Like, for example, frequent descriptive threats of eternal torture will really drive this in, while a child who is instructed without the use of fear will not take it to heart quite so much. Another example is that someone who is taught to be prejudiced against gay people will latch on to those sorts of verses. Of course, being taught to be prejudiced usually coincides with the teaching of those verses as both ideas are passed on by the parents. These are just a few examples of how people end up holding different moral codes to those that most people agree on. There is more that can be expanded on here, but it is really enough for the purposes of this video. It is also worth mentioning that sometimes these alterations can be changed back by appealing to the original moral feelings which someone may hold in a different situation. Using a logical argument can also work to show why their learned ideas are wrong. However, this can be very hard to do because of the effects of cognitive dissonance. These kinds of arguments will come into play in debates we have over some parts of our moral consensus. We also have other parts besides the root moral feeling in a complete ethical decision. These can be a factor in our consensus also. There will be objective facts as well as opinions that will be the data your moral feelings are a response to. You will notice you have certain feelings about the details of a situation. You then apply logic to this moral feeling as well as the data regarding the given situation. This is what makes a complete ethical decision. This is where it gets messy, as some of these things are objective and some are subjective. So it's good to keep this separate from the meta-ethics I talked about earlier. In some situations, what you feel is right may be different from what logic shows to be right on a more quantitative level. For example, in moral dilemmas, people almost universal, universally are okay with letting one person die to save five, whereas they are almost universally unwilling to actively kill one in innocent person in cold blood to save five who were in harm's way because of a risky job they were doing. The standard example is guys working on a railroad track. These moral dilemmas are things which may always be points of contention in a moral consensus. However, most things that matter are much more clear-cut. Harm and consent are a couple big factors in our moral consensus. These are things that allow us to agree on certain moral standards. We can use these standards as the basis of accepted social behavior and a legal system. While these standards have no objective basis, we can show objectively whether or not something conforms to these standards. For example, someone may give a moral justification for behavior many of us regard as bigoted. We can show we are right simply by pointing out the flaws in logic of their justification. For example, we may point out the use of generalizing, a tendency towards us versus them groupthink, and the guilt by association logical fallacy. We can then point out this inconsistency with this moral standard which they normally espouse in situations other than this one. 
So that is how we can debate what is right and wrong without any objective moral source. We have a moral standard logically derived from our social feelings and validated through consensus. This shows how we can make moral arguments by pointing out inconsistencies in someone's acceptance of our moral consensus in some instances with their contrary behavior in other situations where we show the logical flaws in their justification, all without there being any objective source for the aforementioned consensus.